Let's start with the current trading environment. Like, where are we now? I mean, we've seen so much of movement over the last few years. Um, how do you see the current space? Well, I think today's investor obviously has more uncertainty in front of them than I can remember. We were in the green room preparing, and we're looking at the market, and we're like, gosh, the spoos have only moved 20. And in my day, when I started investing, that would have been a year's move, or certainly a half a year's move. And we don't think much of it. And processing that amount of uncertainty and volatility, uh, it's the tools in the background, the preparation uh, that today's investor uh, needs to be up on. So I remember, you know, the, the, the days of 2008, 9, 10, when the market volatility was so high, you know, Citigroup was up 20, 30 percent down in a day sometimes. Then a few years later, we, you know, saw the pandemic, which had unbelievable volatility again. You know, how do you help your clients navigate uh, this new normal of increased volatility? I think it's, again, it's in preparation and education. And we're really trying to teach after 50 years of running an exchange and a global exchange now is really the tools that are out there at every investor's, at every investor's fingertips uh, are really in derivatives. And the ability to predict and to plan for any eventuality, any outcome, changing the P&L from a 45 degree line of the derivatives and outcome based or defining the outcome of an investment is really quite easy. Uh, and in this environment, uh, there is a strategy for every possibility. So you, may, you, you mentioned derivatives, and I go back again, you know, perhaps during the financial crisis, there was a lot of hue and cry about derivatives and how some of those were written. How's your world change, you know, perhaps either from a technology point of view or maybe even compliance point of view in, in, uh, you know, for that particular instrument? Well, I think the instrument itself is quite simple, but the strategies and the complexity is really investor driven. And again, it's with preparation. So there's suitability uh, for every investor. There are products, there's packaged products, there's notes and funds, and it looks quite confusing until you take a step back. Every note, every fund has a prospectus. It has a, a designed outcome. Uh, so wrappers work for quite a few. For me, I like to look at my own strategies, and I have a, a prediction, I have a, a, a direction in the market, and using derivatives allows me to, as, as I say, shape that P&L curve differently. So this is usually, you know, thought about it for the institutional investor, but, you know, where are we now in terms of the Gen Z getting into investing? How is that different, uh, in your opinion, what, than what you have seen over the last, let's say, you know, in, in the previous uh, generations? Really, the access to information. Uh, we've seen a trend. Uh, I started investing in the late 80s. Uh, but the amount of information at your fingertips, fingertips and look at where we are right now, the, the, the availability from Bloomberg in and of itself as a source of information is second to none. The Gen Z investor has the same information professionals had years ago. It is one source. So I, I encourage all new investors and Gen Z investors Take in multiple sources of information. Every source is a good source. There's a source of information for trend investing, for long-term investing, uh, for just day trading. And depending on your strategy and direction, each are suitable, uh, but each have valuable information in and of themselves. So one of the, again, I'll, I'll go back to the, you know, the whole meme mania of a few years ago. And uh, perhaps you know, you know, what, from your vantage point, how did it happen? What was the pluses or minuses in your view? And my uh, obvious, uh, you know, one of the things I, uh, you just mentioned, my biggest objection in some cases was that I couldn't trust the source of information that was coming through. You know, what advice do you give to investors on that? And, you know, I'd love to hear your take on it. Track record. Uh, if a meme investment or pick your favorite social media outlet for information, the information, if you don't trust it, is still very, very valuable fade the information then. It may be right for moments in time. Those are trades, not necessarily investments. So depending on the purpose, that source of information is extremely valuable. And it could be for moments in time. And those are trades, and that's OK. But for long-term investing, I don't think I would necessarily source my long-term strategy from uh, a post that may or may not have at its heart the long-term sustainable investor. And that's OK, but it's still very good information. You know, I'll 
portray the same question in a different way. So during the meme mania, there were certain companies, and I'm, I won't name them, but if you looked at the business model, it says no sane investor would be you know, logically putting any money on it. In it uh, and then you know, stock kept on going up every few days, and so purely because of a push. You know, as somebody who's so senior in the, uh, you know, the, the trading area, um, w w how do you counter some of that stuff? How do you sell that? Because at the end of the day, people need to have confidence in the market that they are pricing you know, assets properly. H how, do you, how do you manage the two? Uh, what's your thought about both those things? Yeah, I think uh, there was a probably a com completely overweight in the attention that Meeb Investing got. That is really not the typical investor. And when I say investor, that's really what SIBO, uh, uh, through our, our, again, our 50 years of running 26 markets around the world, that's not where we're focused. Our focus on, is on sustainable investing. And I only use the meme reference as a point of information. Uh, and it, it, in, in part of the process of developing what might be a short-term strategy. But for us, we, we certainly don't encourage chasing trends. Those might be good trades, but that is not an investment. Uh, ours is really out of measured sustainable investing year, day in, day out, year in, year out. So if you look at you know, the, tec the technology framework, things have developed so much over the past uh, few years from you know, cell phone to cloud computing, et cetera. How have trading platforms changed in that framework and uh, how have they changed based on the different demographics? I think trading, uh, when growing up and watching the business evolve, uh, the technology where we find ourselves today and running uh, lit, transparent, trusted markets around the globe, it, it's really table stakes. And I say that from an exchange operator, and most of uh, my fellow exchange operators view that the same way. We need to be a source of certainty. The risk in trading should not be the platform and the exposure that an exchange has. So rather, we just shrug our shoulders as a trusted operator and saying, you must, ha you, you have an expectation, and our job is to deliver the exposure that you all seek and, not, and take the exchange out of it. Uh, you just have to trust that we are there operating, regulated, uh, and we'll be there the next day. And you know, you're a global uh, company. How, how have you seen the, the differences between different geographies? Uh, I'd love to hear some anecdotes as to how um, you know, trading is different in the US versus Australia versus Europe or any other market that you know, stands out to you. The amount of retail accounts are certainly up over the years, and I think the pandemic was uh, a great catalyst there. Uh, but the engagement is certainly different by geography. In the US uh, and APAC region, many, many more engaged daily uh, investors and traders. In Europe, not so much. Uh, and it is in developing those markets that's one of our keys is to make sure that the experience from an investor you know, depend no matter the geography or the asset class needs to be the same. So when we look into new regions, it's how can we replicate the incredible experience a U.S. Uh, investor has in different geographies as we look across the globe. So emerging markets has always been a big area and discussion point. And, you know, China has been, uh, you know, off in the last couple of years. But before that, it was the place to be for everybody. H how are you navigating that part of the world? Uh, really, it's uh, any market that is open for competition. What I mean by that is there are incumbent national treasure exchanges around the world. But regulators around the world see that competition uh, from exchange operators brings lower cost and better technology. So we chase those uh, geographies that allow for competition. So uh, APEC in, in particular, uh, we operate a PTS uh, in Japan, and we are an exchange operator in Australia. Very important for us that those regulators see the benefit of competition on behalf of their, their customers. Very important for us. Okay. I'm going to take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, um, you know, CBOE has been a strong acquirer lately. What does the future look of uh, CBOE look like, more of an exchange or more of a data provider? Well, data is, uh, the data that we have, the exhaust from running an exchange is extremely valuable uh, in its pure sense. That means in real time, the data from the top of the market, the data from the last trade, the data from the size of the market on the bid ass is extremely valuable. Uh, but what is really important for us is enhancing, enhancing that data. So we can take that raw data and we can show you risk profile across the globe 
that's very, very important as investors have a choice as to where to deploy their capital. So for us, it's not just the pure raw data from running 26 different venues, but what can we do with that data? How do we teach you? How do we give you more information than just the raw data coming off of a trade or coming off of the top of the market? Fair point. Um, as expectations and access to info, uh, information evolve, how are, you, how are you managing new market players? What role should regulation play in this? Regulation, uh, I think we've learned lessons of late, and it's not new to exchange operators who have been in this business for years, uh, is oversight uh, and regulation is key. Uh, running trusted markets, our partners are regulators in every geography. The trust that comes out of highly regulated, transparent markets, I think we've seen examples of when that's not the case. Uh, so for us, uh, again, we just take regulation and oversight as, as part of the game. Uh, in the U.S., we have two regulators, the SEC and the CFTC, very unusual if we look across the globe. But every one of our markets is regulated, and we uh, embrace and look forward to that regulation because it brings trust uh, to the process. And then as an exchange operator, how are you combating the increased prevalence of naked short selling, failures to deliver, and the prevalence of synthetic shares? A great, insightful question. Uh, from an exchange operator, that is really the role of your broker-dealer or introducing broker or FCM. We uh, do not are not in the business of the suitability, whether it's uh, from the short side, uh, the uncovered short, or the hard-to-barrel hard side. Uh, that is really a level removed from us. That's uh, we don't we don't go direct to customer. Uh, unlike uh, the newest asset class, crypto, uh, we actually rely on our partners to make sure the investments uh, for uh, uh, retail and institution are suitable for their need and purpose, and that includes uh, the points in the question. So Ed, you had mentioned um, a few minutes ago uh, in the green room that you know, during the pandemic, you bought a lot of companies. You acquired, I think, eight or nine companies you mentioned. Would love to learn a little bit more about it as to what was the rationale behind, I mean, any one of them, and how do you plan to integrate them to your current offering? I think the pandemic was just interesting uh, from a process and diligence perspective. We found uh, the tools, like all of you found, we adapted quickly, and we're not going to allow the change in our day-to-day -to, -day to affect the path and the direction that SIBO set out to do, and that was to build uh, the world's largest network uh, of trusted markets. So again, back to the theme, in geographies and asset classes that were open for competition, we were full throttle, and we did not let the pandemic slow us down. We found very effective ways to run diligence, and we're in the process now of integrating those markets so that we have a common platform across the globe that our customers, they plug into us in London, in New York, um, Amsterdam, Tokyo, Australia, in Toronto, they're all the same experience that we're building on and migrating the same technology platform. So that's consistent, it's trusted, it's lit, and it's regulated. And most recently, we're into the crypto space. We bought an exchange here in Chicago called ArisX, which is now SIBO Digital. And we're extending the same experience, the same trust uh, to uh, the crypto and tokenized exposure. Uh, crypto, let's talk about crypto. We made it a long time without bringing it up. I was waiting for the last five minutes. And, um, <laughs> what's your take on it? I mean, I'm, I'm very curious about it going back to, you know, all the way from the concept of crypto to the ability for people to, you know, trade it uh, with trust. I mean, the headlines we have seen over the last couple of months is just, you know, a, probably the trip of the iceberg. We're going to probably see more of that. Um, you know, for me, just teach us what happened in this particular case uh, or, you know, your take on this entire concept. Well, I think the, the observations, I don't have any insight that's different than perhaps what you and what, what Bloomberg would cover or, or the opinions that you've, you've heard. But from an exchange operator's perspective, you know, it's head scratching to us uh, that the conflicts that exist not just day to day with customer funds, but the lack of government, governance and oversight is unthinkable, uh, first in a public company uh, that operates globally, but from an exchange operator who is highly regulated and views regulation as partnership, um, the concepts and the, the uh, conflicts are, are unthinkable. So uh, moving into the space, and we were actually uh, well down the road long before the problems that are in the headlines today uh, with crypto and tokenized exposure, 
uh, of, of AirSX onboarding, and it's just, uh, for us, the model didn't change. Uh, we wanted to extend into the new asset class the same trust so that you can, if you want, exposure uh, of crypto. The risk is not in the operator. Again, back to the theme. The risk should be in your perception of being long or short a given token, not whether or not SIBO is going to open up its digital platform the next day or if your funds were misused. So our model relies very much on our trusted partners and introducing brokers and FCMs. It's very friendly that way. Uh, and the direct-to-customer, uh, while an interesting concept, the amount of risk, oversight, and value add uh, from the traditional approach uh, is still uh, what SIBO uh, aims to deliver for customers. See, while I don't understand crypto as much, but you know, I, I have some idea about blockchain. Yeah. Um, how are, are you embedding that in your operations, or it's already there? Would, you know, any any comments on that? So, from an exchange operator, the speed of transaction uh, right now, the DLT would be challenged to deliver. But there's post-trade um, technology that might be more suitable in a shorter time frame. But we are very much listen to our customers and our customers, not retail, institutional, liquidity providers, who are not asking us to pivot uh, from the technology that they're used to today uh, onto DLT for day-to-day -day, uh, transactions. So we'll listen, we'll learn, uh, and as technology uh, cuts down that latency, uh, that, that might be a conversation for the future. I'm just curious because I've always thought a good database should do exactly what a blockchain would would you know take care of. Have you ever done any back testing as to you know would it save you some error rate, some costs if you ever go down that rate, or you know the way it works uh, is is good both for accuracy and uh, and and, and uh, speed. Right now it's speed, so the latency uh, would just not be able to support the amount of transactions and processing uh, in today's derivatives world which is multiples of, of the equity space. So it, technology will catch up. We know that. Um, technology has proven itself uh, to catch up. So it is a qu definitely a question for the future. Uh, another question from the audience. Are you planning to release more uh, crypto trading products? Uh, we are. We're very mindful in the US uh, of the debate uh, between the CFTC, the SEC, and now the Hill on oversight. And in particular, uh, whether some tokens represent securities exposure uh, or not. And as that debate unfolds, our goal is to receive CFTC approval for margin futures. Uh, we have state by state approval to run an exchange in the US. Uh, and we will be taking this slowly as the SEC and the CFTC debate jurisdictional oversight. Uh, but our goal is, of course, to offer more and more exposures than the current five tokens that we do today. Fair point. Uh, another question, uh, how are you shifting uh, your operations to the cloud? Uh, what are the benefits to your customers? So for right now, it's data. So our data and source uh, to the cloud is really on distribution and, and being able to access data anywhere in the world. So our first big move uh, on behalf of our customers was really in the data space. And we do want to make sure that anyone has access to SIBO's data. As I say, that is the first step. That is how we back test. That's how you all learn. That's how we are able to enhance data. So the first move uh, was uh, with data to the cloud. Fair. Uh, do you foresee the development of a blockchain-based carbon credits exchange? And for people like me who don't know what a carbon credit is, it's the offset environmental impact by making environmental positive into a product. Yeah, I don't think I'd answer as specific as just a, a, as an offset uh, for carbon credits. Rather, the tokenization of things that we know and making those tokens and allowing the boundaries that we are currently uh, forced with delivery, for example, uh, boundary lists. I think tokenization and, and moving assets you know onto token uh, will be uh, a trend over the next year. So not just credits, but I think much more broadly than that. 